Ultra Moon is full of beautiful shiny Pokemon, but as we all know, shinies aren't actually any stronger in battle. So I want to see if my team of shinies can blaze through Alola in a hardcore Nuzlocke. I began my hunt early in the morning, and obviously I was gonna hunt for a shiny Litten. I'm not kidding when I say I was soft resetting all day, but over 3,000 attempts later, it was all worth it, as I found myself a beautiful white Litten who I called Quartz. It wasn't long before me and Quartz were faced with our first rival battle, and look how cute this guy looks. It was safe to say that House Rowlet did not stand a chance. I then visited Kukui's shack? and found him researching his own moves. Hold on, what is he? I already had to start my next shiny hunt, because let alone fighting Elima or the totem Pokemon, no matter how hard I tried, I could not figure out how to get past the trainer school with just my Litten. So with a bit of luck and just under 4,000 encounters, I found myself a shiny Grubbin. I caught him and called him Ruby. And with this little wonder bug on my team, I took on Teacher Emily. I went for a bite on the Poplio, dealing some good damage, but its water gun hit me back hard. I then went for another bite, and not only did I get a critical hit, but it also made the Poplio flinch. After getting hit by the next water gun, Ruby's Orenberry was triggered, letting us go for one final bite to finish this battle off. Despite the fact that I got super lucky in that battle, I've already spent nearly 15 hours on this run, and I'm not even at the first totem yet, so I would really appreciate if you guys could hit that subscribe button and leave a like on the video. Well, there really wasn't much for me to do before taking on the very first island captain, Elima. I once again led with my beautiful red ruby and hit her young noose with a bite. He tackled back, but it wasn't very effective. I went for another bite and once again the opponent flinched. Maybe there's something more to these shinies we don't know about, because on the very next turn, he flinched again. After Elima's potion, he flinched for the third time. Okay, what the fu- well, I guess that's Young Goose. Smeargle was up next, and actually managed to hit Ruby with a critical hit tackle, to which I retaliated with, you guessed it, another bite. And after one final bite, I had to switch out to Quartz to not risk getting KO'd. After tanking a tackle with Quartz, I went for an Ember, but got hit with a super hard hitting Water Gun before that, but healing back up to 19 health with my Orenberry. It was now or never. Smeargle went for his final Water Gun, but Quartz survived on just 5 health health, letting him go for one last ember to finish the first captain off. An even bigger challenge than Elima was making it to the island trial without overleveling. My Pokemon were literally at 10 and 13 XP off of having to be boxed, and I was not in the mood for another shiny hunt quite yet. I then took on Totem Redicate at my first island challenge. Thankfully, I was in for an easier battle for the first time in this run. Ruby was the obvious choice to lead with, and after hitting Redicate with a super effective bug bite, it was left on low health. Redicate's bite really wasn't an issue, and after just one more bug bite, it was game over. I didn't want to risk getting KO'd by the Redita though, so I sent out Quartz to make quick work of him. And after just one Fire Fang, I had completed my first island challenge. It was great to have an easier battle for once, but after nearly an hour of strategizing and calculating, I came to the conclusion that it was absolutely impossible for me to beat this island's Grand Kahuna with my current team, so I had to go and hunt for my next shiny Pokemon. If I wanted to find a shiny Pokemon, I had to think like one. Actually, more than that, I had to look like one. So I composed my shiny trainer outfit. I'm just praying this works and doesn't end up scaring them away because... Ugh. I really needed a flying type to help me out here, so I started my next hunt in the Verdant Cavern, and after around just 2,000 encounters, I found myself a shiny Noibat. This guy is one of my favorite shinies in Gen 7, and I mean, how could you not love her? That color scheme is absolutely beautiful. Now after catching her and calling her Emerald, it was time to take on the first island kahuna, Hala. I led with Emerald and went for a wing attack, leaving the matchup with less than half health. Matchup hit back with a revenge. Hitting Emerald pretty hard, but the next wing attack was enough to take it out. Makuhita was up next, and after hitting Emerald with a fake out, Emerald was healed back up with its Citrus Berry. I kept going for wing attack, dealing tons of damage against Makuhita, but it wasn't enough to KO, letting him hit me with an arm thrust, and even though it was an easy KO on the next turn, I realized my damage calculations were off, and it was not looking good for me. Well, Crab Brawler was finally sent out, and he led with his Z move all out pummeling. 
and this brought Emerald down to just 10 health. I countered with a wing attack and I managed to get a crit which was so necessary for winning this battle. Since Emerald was on such low health, I was honestly ready to lose her. She had done amazing and at least I'd be able to win the battle, but Crabrawler's pursuit actually left her on just 2 health and just one more wing attack somehow was enough to KO it. I have no idea how we did that with no casualties, but that's the first grand trial done. And Quartz seemed to like this too, as after this battle, he evolved into a beautiful shiny Toracat. Now, after a smooth or not so smooth sail to Kala Island, I was faced with a plethora of tough battles. Thankfully for maybe the first time ever, Cena wasn't a tough battle and neither was Hop, as my shiny Toracat absolutely blasted through his team. Gladion also wanted to face off here and he was honestly really close to KOing me, but Quartz still managed to seal us the deal. Okay, maybe those battles weren't so tough after all. I wasn't ready for Akala's first trial yet though, so after a bit of training, Ruby evolved into a beautiful full red box? Well, let's not judge a book by its cover and see if this guy's better in battle than what he looks. Leading with Ruby, I took on Totem Araquanid, and after getting hit by a bubble, I went for an acrobatics, which once again was a critical hit, nearly taking him out. Masquerade joined Araquanid in battle as his ally, whose intimidate was gonna force me to switch out, but since I got a crit on the last turn, I just decided to go for one last acrobatics and finish off the totem Pokemon. Not too bad for a rectangle. My next challenge challenge was trying not to die from cringe at the royal arena. I mean, how is everybody dressed all crazy and I still have the worst outfit? Well, at least my Pokemon look nice. Kiawe's trial was my next big battle, but I honestly had no clue how to go about beating him, so I took the easy, or well, not so easy way out, and went looking for my next encounter. I wanted to guarantee myself a water type to give me the biggest advantage against Marowak that I could get, so after over 5,300 encounters, I found myself a shiny tentacle who I called Amethyst. It wasn't long before I got to try out the shiny in battle, as next up, I took on Totem Marowak. I went for a protect right off the bat, saving me from getting hit by a flame wheel, and more importantly, letting me take on Salazal at full health. Thankfully for some really bad AI move choices, Marowak went for a detect, and the Salazal only got off a torment, and this let me get off a Hydro Vortex on Salazal, easily taking it out, and letting me face the Marowak one-on-one. -on -one. Since Marowak is super beefy at this point in the game, I started off with an Acid Spray, dealing nearly no damage, but harshly dropping its special defense. After a couple filler moves, I was finally able to go for a Water Pulse after getting hit by a Hex, and due to its minus two special defense stats, this Water Pulse hit super hard, and it even managed to confuse it. Since Torment was still active, I had to go for a Protect here, and while I was hoping for Marowak to hit itself in confusion, that didn't happen. Happen. I really needed Marowak to hurt itself on the next turn, but once again that didn't happen, and it got off a brick break on Amethyst, leaving him at only 5 health. But that didn't matter as I was able to go for one final water pulse, finally taking out the totem Marowak. After bumping into Colgate and his toothpaste friends, I headed straight to Akala's final island trial at the lush forest. Now, I have to admit, I was slightly unprepared for this battle, as I thought this would be an absolute sweep. And, well, I wasn't too far off. I went for a workup to boost Toracat's attack stats, while Laurentis's X Scissor really didn't hurt much. On my second turn, all I did was hoped for the best and went for an Inferno Overdrive. And with my boosted attack, how was it ever not gonna KO? With my final Island Trial on Akala finished, I had a sip of this suspicious stew, and I can understand why all the Pokemon in the forest run to it. They're trying to kill whoever came up with that recipe. I mean, what's even in that thing? A rock? Speaking of rocks, next up was Akala's grand trial, facing the rock type leader, Olivia. Olivia was once again way too tough for me to face now, so after grabbing myself the most respected and loved move in the game, double team, I honestly still wasn't ready to face Olivia, so I once again found myself in the ocean looking for more water types. I found myself a cozy little fishing spot with amazing encounters, and after around 2,500 
100 encounters, which by the way felt like an eternity, and was taking me nearly 6 hours to achieve because I suck at using the fishing rod, I finally found myself a shiny wishy-washy. Well, not only does this shiny not look great, honestly it was one of the worst encounters on this route at this point in the game. Was the Magikarp really that much to ask for? I of course still caught him and called him Citrine. Now the reason I wasn't happy was that I'm not a big fan of super slow Pokemon in Nuzlocke, especially when they can't set up or have any good attacking moves. Well, hopefully it's enough for me to beat Olivia though, so let's see what's gonna happen. I sent out my lovely shiny school form Citrine to face her Anorith and use the only status move I had available, Tearful Luck. Now since this guy is pretty tanky, all I really did with him was that I lowered Anorith's attack and when Citrine was brought to low health, I went for a rest and since Anorith did barely any damage at this point, I was able to lower Anorith's attack as low as it goes to minus 6. Once that was handled, I sent out Ruby, who although is weak to rock type moves, was now faced with an Anorith whose attack stat was lower than a Bidoof, so I was safely able to set up 3 iron defenses taking me up to plus 6 defense. I then started perhaps the cheesiest tactic in Nuzlocke history, double teaming. But honestly, can you blame me? Lycanroc would otherwise one shot any of my Pokemon, this was literally all I could do. Well, I eventually got up to plus 6 evasion and plus 6 defense, and at this point I was ready to start demolishing this Anorith. I did first go for a rest to bring me back to full health, and as Anorith was barely able to hit me, and whenever he did, it did next to no damage, I was able to KO the fossil Pokemon with nearly full health. Next up though was the leap, and I decided to hit it with a crunch, even managing to lower her defense which was so amazing. It hit back with an ancient power, which, being a special move, hit me for a lot of damage. My second crunch though left her at low health, but even though I avoided her second hit, I still wasn't comfortable taking on the Lycan Rock with half health, so I went for a rest to try and give me a fighting chance here. Don't ask me how, but Lilip somehow ended up missing 3 ancient powers in a row, and this left me in a great spot to finish off the battle. My next crunch didn't KO her, but she just once again missed, but as I was expecting to KO her, I completely forgot about her super potion which healed her back up. My next crunch did tons of damage, and thankfully, the very next one was a critical hit, and somehow, I was up against Olivia's Lycanroc at full health, and everything was looking perfect. Lycanroc even missed his first attack, letting me hit it with a crunch which did some okay damage. His bite did hit me though, but thanks to my increased defense, it literally only did 6 hit points of damage, and my crunch in return left Lycanroc at half health and with lower defense. Look, I have no idea how this happened, but I was able to take down the second Grand Kahuna after only taking 12 damage against Pokemon that were super effective against Ruby. This left me feeling great as I continued on my adventure towards Ula. Ula, Ula Island. Amethyst was so excited to be on the new island that he evolved into a shiny tentacruel. On the top of Hokulani Mountain, I was tasked to look for the missing charger bugs. But wait a minute, why aren't they red? Mole must have been too lazy to shiny hunt. I'm just surprised he made it to the LH4 with no work ethic. I took on Mount Hokulani's island trial, but before I even got to take on the totem Pokemon, Quartz evolved into a shiny Incineroar. And after seeing him in battle for the first time, I knew I made the right choice. Choice pick and Lidden. As Togedemaru usually starts off with a spiky shield, I decided to go for a work up to boost my attack. On the next turn, I hit it with a super effective Fire Fang, which did some decent damage, but not enough to KO in two hits. And because of this, I had to tank another Zing Zap as I went for a second work up. At this point, I was ready to finish this battle off, so I went for a Fire Fang on the Togedemaru, but it saved itself with a spiky shield. Togedemaru's Zing Zap really started hurting me, but thanks. Thankfully, Skarmory Steelwing missed, and I went for a Darkest Lariat on the Togedemaru, and this was just enough to take it out, and help me complete Ula Ula's first island trial. Guzma tried to intimidate me after this, but he was quickly dealt with, and after a quick pit stop in Blush Mountain, Ruby finally evolved into a shiny Vikavolt, which I was so excited to use in battle because its sprite is so cool. I didn't waste any time and took on Totem Mimikyu at Acerola's island trial. Since Mimikyu's ability doesn't let me damage it on the first turn. After getting hit by a Shadow Claw, I went for an Acid Spray, which lowered its special defense by two and also broke its disguise. Mimikyu hit me with another Shadow Claw, which took me down to low health, but after eating a Citrus Berry, I went for yet another Acid Spray to bring its special defense down to 
to minus 4. Bennett also hit me with a Will-O-Wisp, but I wasn't too worried about it. For some odd reason, I went for a barrier here, risking Amethyst's life for literally no reason, but thankfully he survived at just 6 health, letting me swap out into my shiny Vikavolt on the next turn. And this guy doesn't just look awesome, he is awesome. Because after just one Thunderbolt, the Mimikyu was annihilated, and Bennett, well, he didn't survive for much longer either. I ran into yet another Unova trainer in Grimsley, and based on how he looks, he must be doing either really bad or really good? Guzma also once again tried to defeat me, but as usual, it led nowhere. This left me with nothing else to do, apart from taking on Ula Ula's Kahuna, Nanu. I sent out Amethyst to deal with a Sableye, and after getting faked out on turn 1, I landed a Brine on the next turn, and then tanked a Shadow Ball that did a surprisingly large amount of damage. My next Brine left Sableye at just under half health, but Sableye Shadow Ball also left me low. I had to pray that Brine got the damage boost on Amethyst's next turn, and thankfully it did, knocking the Sableye out. Nanu sent out Krokorok next, and since his earthquake would have been deadly to Amethyst, I sent out Ruby because of his levitate ability. After tanking a crunch pretty well, I went for an X scissor on the Krokorok, and it ended up being a critical hit, knocking it out in just one hit. Alolan Persian would have definitely knocked out Ruby in one hit, so I switched out into Citrine to try and tank whatever was to come, and it was actually just a fake. Out. There wasn't much to do here, so I went for a tearful look on the Alolan Persian, but it went for its Z move first, dealing a ton of damage. Since the Persian was slightly weakened, I sent out Quartz, who tanked Persian's Dark Pulse like it was nothing. Persian went for a Power Gem next, which did decent damage, while I countered with a Fire Fang, which did not hit very hard. But I really didn't have any other options here, and while I had given Quartz a Citrus Berry to leave him with just enough health to finish the Persian off, she got a crit on the next turn, leaving Quartz at just 9 health, and even though I got off another Fire Fang, Quartz was no longer able to take out the Persian, because even though I went for a Fire Fang here, Nanu healed her up with a Hyper Potion, so after one final Power Gem and a Fire Fang combo, I was forced to switch out into Amethyst, who was thankfully able to tank a Power Gem with ease. Persian tried to end this battle off with a Dark Pulse, but after leaving Amethyst at just 18 health, O'Brien was more than enough to finish off Ula Ula's Island Kahuna. After enjoying Nanu's mental breakdown after his loss, I achieved my biggest milestone in this run so far, which was having Emerald finally evolve into a Noivern and become viable for the first time since the first island. And this came just in time, as next up I actually had a super difficult battle against Guzma. I sent out Amethyst to start off, and as Guzma only likes to sucker punch with his Galesopod, I was able to set up three barriers, buffing my defense up to plus six. I then went for an Acid Spray to bring down his special defense defense, and he still just kept sucker punching. I have no idea what's wrong with his AI, but after the second acid spray, his special defense had taken a big hit, and surprisingly, so had his health. At this point, he had learned that he does have damage dealing moves, but thanks to Amethyst's leftovers, they were completely redundant. I then went for a sludge bomb, and thanks to Galissapod's lower defense, it was an easy one hit. Vikabolt was my next opponent, and even though he was way uglier than Ruby, he still hits just as hard. So so I was forced to switch out into Quartz here, who took a hefty amount of damage from a Thunderbolt. It wasn't enough to KO though, and that was just what I needed. As I went for an Inferno Overdrive, and as I easily outspeed the Vika Vault, it was an easy KO. Pinsir Stone Edge was deadly, so I had to switch out into Amethyst immediately, who still took a lot of damage from the hit, but enough to survive till turn 2, where after another Stone Edge, I started setting up with a barrier. A third Stone Edge hit me, but this time not dealing much damage at all, and after setting up my second barrier, I went for another acid spray after being left at just 24 health from Pinsir Stone Edge. At this point, I wasn't 100% confident that a sludge wave would KO, so I played it safe, and after yet another Stone Edge, I went for another acid spray. Amethyst's leftovers came in clutch here, as it was basically healing him up as much as a Stone Edge did each turn, so I was able to get off a free acid spray, finishing this battle off. Last, but definitely not least, was Guzma's Masquerade and I was once again in big trouble, so I sent out Citrine to help me out. He was able to tank Air Slash really well, and let me go for a soak on the Masquerade to change its typing to water. I sent out Ruby next to try and go for the KO, and after tanking both an Air Slash and a Bug Buzz, I got a Thunderbolt off, which absolutely demolished the Masquerade and finished this battle off. After a quick visit to Lusamine's Freezer Room, she must have thought I was
was hungry, so to protect her food, she took me on in battle. I started off with Citrine, and as usual, I hit her with a tearful look after tanking her psychic. I managed to get off three tearful looks before I was forced to switch out into Quartz. I had to set up here if I wanted any chance at winning this battle, so after three workups, I started flame charging the Clefable to increase my speed. And I actually got the crit here, but that was super unlucky, as I was hoping to increase my speed twice before facing her next Pokemon. My Lotic was my next foe, and as she was this run's biggest threat, I went for a malicious Moonsault here, and after all of my stat boosting, it was a guaranteed KO. Beware was my next opponent, and I was able to go for a Flame Charge here, making sure I'd outspeed any of her Pokemon. Which was great, but I didn't account for the fact that I was hit with a Dual Chop, surviving on just 5 health. On the next turn, a final flame charge was enough to finish the beware off. Lopunny was sent out next, but a darkest lariat was more than enough to KO it in one hit. Last but not least was her Lilligant, but I'm sure you can guess how this one ended. I enjoyed a little dance party with Lily before heading to my last challenges on Pony Island. At this point, I really liked my team, but as this is a Nuzlocke, anything can happen, so not wanting to take any risks, I started my hunt for my final shiny Pokemon in the vast Pony Canyon. It took me well over 6,000 encounters, and while I was hoping for our duck trio, I found myself a shiny Carbink, which may not be the coolest Pokemon, but I'm sure I'll find a use for him. I caught it and called it Sapphire. It wasn't long before I was able to see it in battle for the first time, as next up I faced the first island trial on Pony Island, Totem Komowo. A pseudo-legendary Pokemon with boosted stats was always gonna be an unfair fight, so I played dirty too, and after tanking a Drain Punch, I hit it with a Toxic. Noivern joined Komo O in battle to try and help out, but I went for a Protect to stall out the Komo O as much as I could. I was confident I could survive another attack, so I decided to go for a rest on this turn, and just as I predicted, I was left on 14 health after their combined hits. I was back to full health, and after a Chestoberry, Sapphire was wide awake. I of course went for another Protect here, and the Toxic damage was really starting to hammer down Komo O's health. I tried to protect again, but it failed and forced Sapphire to tank a few more hits. This does mean that protect was guaranteed to work on the next turn. So after evading both of their attacks, toxic damage was way too much for Komoa to handle. And just like that, I finished my second to last island trial. This was such a big win that I had to celebrate by blessing the world with my musical talent. <laughs> Ultra Megalopolis held my hardest foe so far in Ultra Necrozma, but I had a plan. Even with Sapphire's insane defensive stats, there was no way it was surviving a hit from Necrozma, so I equipped it with a Focus Sash, and you guessed it, hit Necrozma with a Toxic. On my next turn, I of course went for a Protect to stall it as much as I could, but I was then forced to send out Citrine to easily tank a Smart Strike. A Protect was always going to be the optimal move here, and I crossed my fingers and prayed that it would go for a Photon Geyser next, and thankfully it did, dealing no damage to Quartz as I sent him out. One final Protect was enough to KO the strongest Pokemon to ever exist. I love being toxic. I actually love it so much that I wanted to share the love with my final island trial, and after sending out Sapphire against Totem Rambambi, I continued my streak with yet another toxic. Rambambi's ally came out on the next turn, and she was super effective against me, so not wanting to take any risks, I went for a protect right off the bat, while both of my opponents started setting up. I was scared of getting crit here, so I sent out Amethyst to try and play this as safe as I could, and thankfully he was able to tank a dazzling gleam with ease. Protect was the obvious next choice here, as Rabumbi tried to go for the KO, but was not able to. It was once again too risky to stay in, so I sent Sapphire back out, and as the AI went for a bug buzz, this was a free switch out. Rabumbi was left on red health, so after one final Protect, I finished off the very last island trial in Alola. There was just one grand trial left, and this was where I was headed to next. Hapu's Golurk was up first, and I honestly had no good way of setting up against it, so I sent out Quartz and went for a malicious Moonsault to take him out in just one turn. Mudsdale was definitely gonna go for a Z move here, so I finally gave Emerald some screen time as I used her flying type to evade it. I went for an Air Slash next, and not only did it deal decent damage, it even made the Mudsdale flinch. I went for another Air Slash, but this time Mudsdale was able to retaliate with a payback. I went for a final Air Slash, hoping to finish the Mudsdale off, but it was left on just a sliver of 
of health, and as Hapu was gonna heal up, I decided to roost too. I kept on going for air slash, and I made the Mudsdale flinch yet again. After a psychic from Emerald, it was game over for the Mudsdale. Flygun was definitely gonna KO Emerald here, so I sent out Citrine, who easily tanked the Dragon Breath from Flygon, but ended up getting paralyzed, which could have really messed up my strategy here. But thankfully, I was still able to get off a tearful look and lower his offensive stats. I then sent out Ruby, whose Levitate let him evade Flygon's Earth power. And since Dragon Breath did barely any damage, I was able to spam X Scissor and Crunch until the Flygon was KO'd. I wasn't sure I'd survive a Muddy Water from Gastrodon, so I sent out Amethyst, who avoided the attack. I went with the usual Acid Spray here to lower her special defense, but after getting hit by a hard hitting Mud Bomb, I had to switch out into Emerald for the second time. Since Gastrodon had no moves that could really hurt Emerald, I roosted up to full health to play this as safe as I could, and then finished this battle off with two more air slashes. And that's the last Grand Kahuna finished. And all that was left to do was take on the Elite Four and become champion. Gladion tried to bother me for the last time too, but I mean, it's Gladion. He stood no chance. After teaching my Pokemon a couple new moves with the hard scales I got from fishing, I took on my final challenge at the Elite Four. I faced Molain first and led with Quartz, setting up with a bulk up after Klefki set up a reflect. I went for yet another bulk up while Klefki set up spikes. I was worried that Klefki would go for a Thunder Wave at any time now, so I started my setup with Flame Charge, boosting my speed while I easily tanked the Flash Cannon. I was honestly worried that this still wasn't enough though, so I went for one final bulk up and then finished the Klefki off with one final Flame Charge. Metagross was gonna be a big threat, so I did what I had to, and went for a malicious Moonsault to take it out in just one hit. Dugtrio's Earthquake was what I was most scared of in this entire battle, so I crossed my fingers as I went for a Flame Charge, and thankfully it was enough to finish the job. Magnezone was a slight issue, as it was able to tank a Flame Charge due to its sturdy ability, but thankfully Quartz was able to tank a Thunderbolt with relative ease, and after a Flamethrower it was game over. Bisharp was last up, but he was the least of my worries, and one last Flame Charge was more than enough to end this battle. For my second fight, I took on Acerola, and once again, I decided to lead with Quartz. Banet only has physical moves, so I was able to set up with bulk up really easily. The only issue was that Banet kept using Screech on me, so even though I was able to hit like a truck, by the end of my setup, my defense was super low, and I could not afford to get hit by absolutely anybody in this battle, or it would be game over. I wasn't really worried about Pelosand, as a malicious Moonsault was more than enough to KO her in one hit. As Delmi's is part grass type, I used this chance to set up with a flame charge to really make sure I'd be able to outspeed her frost lass, and thankfully, I was, knocking her out with one darkest lariat too. I used the exact same strategy on her drift blim, and with one final hit, I took down the second Elite Four member. For my third battle, I took on Kaui, this time leading with Citrine. Her Braviary's Brave Bird was super hard hitting, but Citrine was still able to tank it and hit him with a tearful eyes. I then sent out Amethyst to tank his next hit, and he did a pretty good job at it. It was too risky for me to start setting up now, so I started off with a rest, bringing me back up to full health, and waking up with the help of a Chesto Berry. Braviary's next Brave Bird did loads of damage, but I was able to set up my first barrier here, and from here on out, that's all I did. I kept setting up with barrier and resting when I needed to, and by the end of it, her Braviary was only doing 14 damage with his hits. I eventually woke up from my final rest and hit him with an Ice Beam that finally KO'd him. Mandibuzz was not really a threat at this point, so I hit her with an Ice Beam and actually ended up freezing her, but she somehow thawed out instantly and got off a Brave Bird that really didn't do much. After a second Ice Beam, she went for another Brave Bird, and at this point, I decided to rest because, well, why not? I was back at full health and she was barely hurting me. When I eventually woke up from my sleep, I got off yet another Ice Beam, this time getting a critical hit and knocking the bird out. I went for an Ice Beam on the two cannon too, and got yet another critical hit, and froze him. But he also managed to thaw out instantly, getting off a Z move that did a pathetic amount of damage. My Ice Beam on that turn froze him again, but as usual, he thawed out. Not that it mattered much though, as another Ice Beam absolutely demolished him. Since Oricorio is a special attacker, her hits were actually gonna hurt me. So after tanking just one Air Slash and going for a Sludge Wave, I sent out Sapphire, who was barely scratched by an Air Slash. She confused me 
me with a teeter dance, but got wiped off the face of this earth with an ancient power. Last but not least was Hall Lucha, who tried to hurt me with a poison jab, but after a moon blast, it was clear to see how this fight was gonna end. After tanking another poison jab, one more moon blast was enough to end this battle and move my focus on the final Elite 4 member, Olivia. Just like my last encounter with her, I led with Citrine, and after getting hit with an X Scissor, I used Tearful Look on her Armaldo. On the second turn, X Scissor was starting to hurt, but Citrine Citrus Berry healed him right back up and let him get off yet another Tearful Look. And I repeated this until I was forced to switch out, but by that point, Armaldo was at minus 4 attack, so I got a free swap out into Quartz. I started my setup with Bulk Up, and I did this 4 times until I felt confident I'd be able to take down the rest of Olivia's Pokemon, and then finished Armaldo off with a Flame Charge. Gigalith was way too tanky to take any risks here, so I went for a Malicious Moonsault to guarantee the one hit KO. Lycanroc Z move was almost certainly gonna KO me, so I went for a Darkest Lariat, and thankfully it was enough to earn me the knockout. Since Probo Pass does have Sturdy as his ability, I needed to swap out here, so I sent out Ruby to fly right over her Earth Power. I knew I could tank one hit here, so I went for a quad effective dig and hit it for major damage, while Power Gem wasn't enough to KO me. One more dig was more than enough to finish this battle off. Cradili was a massive threat to Ruby, so I sent out Amethyst to easily tank a rock throw. I went for an Ice Beam with Amethyst, which didn't do a lot of damage, but should be enough to KO this plant. My second Ice Beam didn't leave her in range of a one-hit KO, so I went for a Sludge Wave next to take her down to low health. Olivia's full restore really sucked because I was no longer able to KO it quite yet, so I went for a rest to try and heal myself back up to enough health to be able to face it, but honestly, it was just a waste of time as I was forced to switch out into Emerald either way. Her Rock Tomb in combination with Spikes really hurt Emerald, so I had no choice but to Roost here, after which I was able to go for an Air Slash that did decent damage. At this point, I noticed that Cradili had run out of PP on her Rock Tomb, meaning she had literally no way of KOing me here, even with a critical hit on each one of her turns, but I still played this safe and roosted back up to full health, until finally hammering her down with a couple more Air Slashes. Last but not least, I had my very last battle against Hao. Let's see, can I beat Pokemon Ultra Moon using only shiny Pokemon? I led with Ruby here, and after tanking a Psychic pretty well, I went for a super effective Bug Buzz, which absolutely destroyed Hao's Raichu. Crabominable was up next, and it was definitely gonna knock me out, so I swapped out into Sapphire, who easily tanked Crabominable's Stone Edge. He went for an Ice Hammer next, which was actually perfect, because it brought his speed down below mine, letting me get off my second Moon Blast before his next turn, KOing him on just 23 health. Tauros was easily gonna outspeed Sapphire, so I was forced to send out Emerald to easily tank his Iron Head. Double Edge did a truckload of damage against Emerald, but Brick Break really hurt him too, and for some reason, instead of KOing me on his next turn, he sent out his objectively uglier and worse Noivern. Okay, it did still manage to KO Emerald, but I just wanted to give him some pity points. I mean, look at that guy. My Mon was way cooler. I sent out Amethyst to deal with Noivern, and after a quite effective Ice Beam, it was always gonna get KO'd. Tauros was sent back out, and his Earthquake was deadly, so I sent out Ruby to levitate over it. I tried going for a Thunderbolt, but was KO'd before I had a chance. You did great, Ruby. I sent out Citrine next to deal with the Tauros, and even though how healed up here, Aqua Tail still did massive damage, and it actually ended up being a crit, leaving Tauros back at just a sliver of health. Ho once again got scared and switched out into Vaporeon whose water absorb completely blocked my Aqua Tail. This was actually perfect for me though as Vaporeon was not able to damage Citrine at all, so I went for Tearful Look as many times as I could. And when all of Vaporeon's offensive stats were at minus 6, I sent out Quartz for the very last time. I started bulking up here and I bulked up till I was at plus 6 defense, but my attack wasn't actually any higher because of Vaporeon's baby doll 
allies. At this point, I was not ready to end the battle off, so I went for a malicious moonsault here, because I did not want Vaporeon to lower my attack any more than it already had. Tauros' earthquake would have been deadly if my defense wasn't tripled. After a flame charge to boost my speed, I went for one final flamethrower and finished Tauros off. Decidueye was Hao's final Pokemon, and I decided to go for a flamethrower to bring him down to less than half health. I was confident this battle was over, but Decidueye's smackdown ended up being a critical hit, lowering down Quartz's health to 24. But thankfully, that was all he could do, as one final flamethrower was enough to knock out his Decidueye and make me champion of Alola. This video took me way too long to make, so make sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you enjoyed these types of videos.